Welcome back to the Dino Bidala Show. It's Friday, March 8th, the day after the State of the Union. And we have three great comedians, journalists. They're all hybrids breaking down what happened, what happened all week in our weekly segment, What Just Happened. Joining us again, Alex Berg. She tells stories in front and behind the cameras, writing about topics on reproductive health care, queer culture, personal essays for outlets including NBC News, Teen Vogue, and Out Magazine, and recently retired from skating with the Gotham Roller Derby. I didn't know you retired. I saw that on... How long ago? I retired. uh, I retired last year. I was managing my team last year. But let me tell you, like, when you hit your 30s and your ass hits the ground with skates on, like, my body just couldn't handle it anymore. So I'll always love the sport, but my time has come to an end. Man, the 30s, unless there's a Benjamin Button type scenario for me, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'll be going back. So also back, these Sphere is here, journalist, activist, author, best known for TikTok account, Under the Desk News, which is wildly popular on TikTok and on Instagram. V, good to see you. Good to see you. Let's hope that I stay wildly popular on TikTok and they don't ban the app, you know? Well, you know, <laughs> we're going to get into we'll it. talk <laughs> about that because this is, but Donald Trump's right. Ru- said today, it's ridiculous to ban TikTok. I'm not kidding. We should be banning Mark Zuckerberg. And he called him Schmuckerberg because he's an oh, idiot. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. That's the joke he did. And and so, and also back my good friend, Eric Bronstein, who I've known for decades, very funny comic. His comedy has been featured on, on Sirius XM. Also, he's written jokes for SNL Weekend Update over the years and other shows. Eric, good to see you. I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling, I'm, I'm having a good day. My day is probably a lot better than Katie Britt's right now, I would imagine. So <laughs> she gave the Republican response, which you can't even parody an SNL. It is oh unparodable. That's, That's a parody of a parody. I watched thing. it. I couldn't believe it was real. I thought it was AI. But we'll, let's I talk also about thought it. it was AI. <laughs> I'm like, this can't, this, because I didn't watch it last night. I'm not staying up till 11. I go to bed early. And I'm like, and I, today I'm like, this is real. This is. But well, let's get into that in a second because that's just fun. So Biden, State of the Union. Let me review, re- read some of the reviews. I'll put my glass on for this here. Biden takes on Trump and Republicans in fiery State of the Union. Biden, Reuters News. You know, here's CNN. Biden uses feisty State of the Union to contrast with Trump. Even the New York Times gave him a good review. A forceful oh. Biden takes on Trump and his own doubters. And the opening line of the New York Times, which has been so... Trump-esque. It said President Biden delivered an energetic and impassioned speech that was much of a campaign kickoff as it was a State of the Union. It was, you know, so he was fiery. He was good. I actually, oddly enough, like last year's speech better for some reason. I thought it was, I, I like this a lot. This one, people are going nuts over it. I thought last year was great. I thought it was really good. Don't get me wrong. Mm. But I think last year caught me off guard because they heckled him and, and no one expected that. And he turned and he handled them so well. This year, he knew it was coming. So, Alex, you're not in your head. What, what was your reaction to the State of the Union? I feel like a little bit because some of the expectations were low that I was also surprised by the amount of energy that he brought. I thought that he spoke really quickly and that was intentional. And then I also thought that even though with every State of the Union, Democrats always applaud for a Democrat who's president, Republicans always applaud for a Republican who's president. But I feel like with... Super Tuesday happening this week with Trump being the presumptive Republican nominee. I felt like the Democrats really amped it up in the audience and they were like on their feet clapping every single time. So I feel like a little bit because expectations were low for Biden that it was um, maybe surprising to see how nimble he was. And he certainly was ready to respond to Marjorie Taylor Greene and all of the other hecklers. He did. He was very loud. I mean, it's true. It was almost like the guy yelling at people to get off his lawn, but he wasn't yelling, get off my lawn. He was yelling, <laughs> yelling things like, he was really things like, raise the minimum wage, you know, <laughs> pass the Freedom to Vote Act. So it was good yelling because he really, that's what he was saying. And I could see people saying the yelling part, but I thought it was good energy. So V, what was your take? I think the old dog still got bark. I mean, it, mm. he came out swinging. His crowd work was incredible. I mean, Biden was doing like a tight 15 up there and his crowd work was outstanding. I think anybody who thought they were going to shake him forgets that Joe Biden raised Hunter Biden, a very difficult child. And so I felt like he was handling the screaming and like all the craziness from Marjorie Taylor Greene and the tantrums the way that he must have handled, you know, Hunter Biden's outbursts growing up. He was very like, okay, let's give you your time to embarrass yourself. Do you feel better now? Let's move on. So I thought he did great. I was pleasantly surprised surprised um and i thought it was really fun it was a fun state of the union it felt a little fun 
there was a few moments where he like took a break and leaned in it almost like the bridge in like a backstreet boy song was like girl i just want to talk to you right now (laughs) he really did that like he's like america bring it in here you know and the guys are dancing behind like i just want to tell you something you're in my most special and then they break into dance again so eric what about you like you've been heckled countless times right as a comic Oh, you should be. So what, I, I what usually was, Marjorie Taylor Green always comes to my shows and just heckles me. I don't, I know, I don't know why, but uh, yeah. I mean, I, I thought he did. Obviously, the whole thing was like to just show that he's still alive because he's getting such bad press these days. Like, can he? Is it, and we all know he is. I don't know why people forget. You know, like it's been like a year since his last um, State of the Union. He was fine then. So how? I mean, I don't know how much he could have dissipated in like one year. I, what, you know. So to you, it's more just a proof of life event. You're right. Like, he's like, <laughs> but he's that's, alive. That's it. It wasn't. But what that's about- why I want to see. I want to see him on the debate stage with Trump. He's going to win the election when when he starts debating Trump again. Because I think that's when he won it last time. I think people just saw the differences with them being on stage together. You know, the difference between Trump and Biden is that it's a weird thing because Trump is a bully, right? Biden has no problem standing up to people. And it's not like Trump can bully Biden. The minute mm-hmm. Biden stands up, and he will, Trump backs off and goes, well, I don't know, like kind of thing. We saw it years ago. We would see it even more now. So, Alex, what about on, on some substance? I'll ask you each uh, different questions on this. But one was he talked about reproductive freedom. He didn't mention the word abortion. It was in articles afterwards. It was in the speech. And look, that that push, push and pull, attention internally. He's Catholic. He's pro-life personally. Didn't want. He made a choice not to mention abortion. And that might be meaningful for people. The policy is more meaningful for women's lives. But what's your take on, you know, his passionate uh, embrace of the idea of making reproductive freedom a central theme of 2024's campaign? Yeah, I mean, we know from the past midterms that access to abortion is extremely popular among Gen Z voters and that Gen Z voters really want to see candidates um, very clear eyed say that they support abortion access. I thought it was really interesting that the way that he framed his points about access to abortion were, of course, not saying the word abortion, which has been an ongoing issue for him for years at this stage, um, but also that he basically said he wants to re implement Roe. And I feel like this is a moment to remind everybody that Roe is just the basic first level access to reproductive health care. It's a 1973 law. I feel like um, at this stage, he should be uh, having a more, I think, forceful rebuttal of um, the really terrible anti-abortion policies that Republicans want to support, like no exceptions for rape or incest, um, basically that uh, a woman or a person in need of abortion in some states should have to be dying before they can access the procedure. So I think that he could have been, um, I think, even more forceful on this particular issue. I do think that it was really smart um, to bring Kate Cox, who is... Mm -hmm the woman who had to leave Texas to um, access an abortion. And he also brought um, Latoria Beasley, who she was about to get, I think, an embryo transfer in Alabama um, when that uh, that state Supreme Court ruled um, on uh, IVF and basically said that embryos have the same rights as children. So I think that those are very deft choices. Um, but I do think that he could have been even more resolute in backing access to um, abortion. As we know, data has shown that the majority of Americans support access to legal and safe abortions. So we know that this is a popular issue. And I feel like people want to see him with a more full-throated support of abortion access. Uh, V, what about you? Was there any issue that stood out? And do you feel like, because one of the constructive criticisms of Biden leading in is there was no second term bold vision that was going to inspire people. It was a lot what we're against. You know, we're against Trump and January 6th. We're pro-democracy. I get that. But, you know, he talked about a new program to help people buy homes for the first time. You're a middle class. It's $5,000 a year for the first two years, that kind of thing. But do you get a sense? Do you have more of a sense of what Biden would do in a second term? Or is there more work need to be done in that? I think last year he did a great job talking about finish the job and that he would be running again because he was going to finish the job. Um, And one thing that the Democrats are terrible at is talking about their accomplishments. And a lot of times I feel like they have to be on the defense to the Republican offense because they're trying to like maintain normal or trying to say like, well, we're not going to do that. Um, I made two TikToks ahead of the State of the Union. One was Agenda 47, here's Trump's plan for term two. The other was finish the job, here's Biden's plan for term two. The first 15 promises each one had made. 
Hmm. The Trump video has, I think, 5 million views as of this morning, and the Biden one has 147,000. It's not because I have a huge conservative audience that's excited. It's because talking about Trump or talking about the chaos in the Republican Hmm. Party is better content. It resonates with people. It's what they get excited or interested about. It's what they're engaging with. So I think that I don't know that the Biden administration was looking at my TikTok for their, you know, guidance Hmm. on this, but I'm betting that they also realize that platforming a lot of the really dangerous and and spooky things that Trump is saying is actually a greater motivator to vote for Biden than it is for Biden to talk about forward thinking dreams and, and, you know, America's great country stuff. Uh, So I think we're going to see a lot more of that meeting this nationalist agenda from the right and saying, this is what they're saying. Believe them. Don't vote for that. So that's what I think he did. I've been fixated on that five million views in a day. I'm like, what? Oh, yeah, wow. babe. Five million. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have, I have, oh, a, yeah. I just signed up for TikTok recently. I have 170 followers, and one of my videos got 2,000 views, which is pretty big for me. You um, just, but it's I'm not making God- I've been here for four years. I was the yeah. original G of like anchoring the news on TikTok. So we'll get there. It, D- Eric, Dean, you got to dance. You got to dance in those videos. That's how you get pointed there. things. You don't <laughs> have to dance. That was the thing that made me so mad about the. And we'll get to the TikTok, you know, things that are going on. But so often people are like, "Oh, it's a children's dancing app," and I'm like, "It is not. It, it is. You know, we'll get to it." But <laughs> I agree, a- Eric. He tried a little humor near the end. At the top, he joked around. He said they were cheering because I should leave now, and everyone laughed. And then the Republicans mm-hmm. cheered like, you should leave now. And they, he smiled at that, like he <laughs> laughed at that. But I thought, you know, there's also a place for other jokes, like there's two candidates running, I'm the one that's not out on bail, that kind of stuff. <laughs> like, I, those are like, <laughs> good things to say. Like, why not say that? I'm the one not facing 32 counts of the Espionage Act. Okay, <laughs> folks? And just drop the mic. Boom, <laughs> that's right. Who? This is who I am. But Eric, do you think there's more of a place for Biden for comedy? Because he can be funny. He was on Late Night with Seth Meyers just last Monday. had some jokes. Well, I had this idea. When he d- debates Trump, you know how they say t- Trump smells? You heard that story? Yes, I've heard yeah. that. Yeah, I think when he debates Trump, at the beginning of the debate, he should just go, can I move my podium a little further away from Trump? Because he smells. I, I'm not even joking. Trump <laughs> would lose childish. his fucking mind if he did that. Yeah. Right. And uh, you, know, like you don't think that would work? That would work. Why not? I think it would work. Under yeah. his skin. I, also, well, I think those moments also really resonate with people. Like when you see him break with the script of the speech and when he is like, you know, being heckled and then kind of taunting back, I think people really connect with those personal moments. <laughs> and if they're having a harder time connecting with some of the bigger policy ideas. But I thought one other thing that I did want to mention is about the contrast that he was he's painting between himself and Trump in this speech, kind of be to your point, is one area that I do think was a little bit of a lost opportunity is he really only gave a hat tip to LGBTQ plus Americans. I think he mentioned, he said uh, basically that he has the back of transgender folks and then that Congress should pass the Equality Act. And I actually thought this is a really potent place to draw out contrast between Republicans and Democrats in a way that I think is like humanizing and you connect with. For example, um, last week we learned of the tragic death of Nex Benedict, a trans student in Oklahoma. Right now, there is a federal investigation into the school district where Next Benedict died. That that would not happen under a Trump administration. And so I do feel like this was a lost opportunity to make a really clear contrast of here's how I'm different from Trump. I mean, Trump literally is going to criminalize you, stop you from getting health care, make your life a living hell if you're a trans person or a queer American. And here's how I'm different. I, I see the dignity of all people. So I do feel like there were a few mo- a few moments like that that really could have like resonated, made um, a human connection, and also I think really have excited younger voters. It's a great point because there is it's a clear contrast because there's no gray. The GOP has I don't know what they were before, but they've become obviously they're a white supremacist movement. We know that they're a Christian theocratic movement and they're an openly uh, anti-brown movement, but anti-LGBTQ community movement like they're passing law. It's not just words. It used to be words. They would say things. Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, in in Florida and Texas and other places. So you're right. And it's easy for Biden because that's democratic values. We're inclusive. The GOP is not. And I'm talking about Alex Berg, vSphere and Eric Bronstein. So let's talk about the GOP response. Alabama Senator Katie (laughs) Britt, who's like 19, I think. No, she's like 42, but she looks (laughs) very young, did the response. And the Republicans chose to put a woman in the kitchen 
to do the response in Alabama, mm-hmm. where at conception you lose your your uterus becomes on day one at conception your uterus is state property, where they just ban you know it, the fertilization, but that now they're going to have an exception. It looks like with the new law they passed. But in any event, they put an Alabama woman in the kitchen, and they thought this was a good idea, and then it became sort of like an overacting class. I'm not really sure what was going on. Like it was so over the top. She over enunciated words and she was really having moments there. She was like, it was an acting exercise. She'd look away and think and do that sense memory work and then come back to the camera. And I'm like, what is this? Ha- what's, I'm like, what's happening? And I thought she was stealing my soul when I looked into her eyes a few times, like there was something unnerving. Eric, did you watch any of the Katie Britt thing? Cause it really is. Um, mm. Something well, I was, behold. Yeah, I used to think that the Marco Rubio uh, rebuttal years ago was the cringiest thing ever. This blows it away. <laughs> Remember when he was like drinking <laughs> with two hands? Like, oh, I need water. Yeah. I mean, that was just they, they always do that. I think wasn't it what, the other guy, Jindal? Bobby Jindal. Guy, yeah, all these guys are like rising stars in the Republican Party. Then they do that thing and they ruin it immediately. They're just all awful. Like, just they just I don't know. They're not good on TV, I guess. But um, this is, I remember also Alabama, the state, which almost elected a pedophile as a senator. Like it was Boy, close. Boy. Yeah. Well, so. and, but still, Katie Britt, as ridiculous as it was, is still the best senator from Alabama since Tommy Tuberville is the other <laughs> senator who <laughs> yeah. is awful. I mean, V, it almost seemed like we were waiting to hear live from New York at Saturday night in the middle of Not- this thing because. I disagree. It wasn't even Saturday Night Live funny. It was like Christian television funny. This woman was doing the worst Tammy Faye Baker impersonation I've ever seen. There was no song. There was no eyelashes. But it was all the same Christian kind of theater, this like dramatic thing, using the fundy baby voice that they're, you know, taught to use in the trad wife movement. Um, Ah. Last year, Sarah, Mm. Sarah Huckabee Sanders was at least in the living room delivering her rebuttal this year. The Republicans have taken us a step back. Now we're just in the kitchen. Uh, I, I, it was it was difficult. And she said things like, uh, you know, we the, America deserves a leader who isn't diminished and diminutive. And I was like, is she talking about Trump or is she talking about Biden? Like, which one are you mm-hmm. talking about? But uh, yeah, 17 minutes of uh, uncomfortable uh, eye contact in my yeah, house. She was, she, was, she was crapping on TikTok, right? That was a big part of it. She crapped yeah, on TikTok. Biden's the on other TikTok thing, now. The other thing she did that we also saw in the room with the Republicans is um, there was there was a this little inside baseball, but there was a discussion about if Biden would in- invite next Benedict's parents to sit at State of the Union as they get to invite guests. Next Benedict's parents said that they are right now completely overwhelmed with being a public figure and they can't handle it and they're grieving. And so they said, OK, you know what, let's let's give them the time to grieve their child, of course. Lick and Riley's parents said the same thing. They turned down a Republican invitation to sit the State of the Union Mm -hmm. and said, we are at home grieving our child's death privately. Like, please leave us alone right now. We don't want to be in your politics. And then Marjorie Taylor Greene is like making buttons with this kid's face on him and putting him on the chest of George Santos. In the response, Katie Britt is bringing up Lake and Riley as a political pawn to talk about how Biden's weak on the border. Yet the Republicans refuse to bring that border bill to Biden's desk to sign to the point that Biden even says, if Trump needs a participation trophy for us to get this done, then like I'll give him one. He could put his name on the bill as long as we can sign it. So I think there was a lot of disrespect from the Republicans yesterday. And I think to your point, it's cringier than ever. And and it just it isn't slapping the way that it used to. And I'm hopeful that this means that a lot of Republicans or conservatives are just kind of like, this ain't it, man. This ain't working. I wonder if they love But I will say some Republicans, I saw articles, were even criticizing it online on social media. I don't know if they're real Republicans mm-hmm. or not, but it was on Truth Social and they were Trump supporters saying she wasn't good at all. And it was weird. And, and, She's and still awkward. a woman. They're not going to give her any kind of flowers. <laughs> yeah. She's still a woman. That's a good point. I mean, this is the party that does not believe in women's fundamental civil rights. It's the party. I really wish, you know, going back to- If she was just making a sandwich in there and not talking or something, or giving birth, (laughs) maybe they would have been more for that. (laughs) You know, carrying a cross around, like a life-size cross. Like, look at her. She's amazing. Alex, the the one thing to me, and I keep talking about on my show, I would like Democrats to say how Republicans are forcing women against their will to carry a fetus to term because of their religious beliefs are now law. And they will back off the minute you talk about religion. But at least think about the barbarism that we're dealing with in America, where women are forced to carry a fetus against their against their will to term 
because this is the Republican laws. And I wouldn't even give the extreme example of rape or incest. Like just women in general are being forced because this is their views. And I really want to see more of a sincere outrage by Democrats because this is barbarism to me. I, I call my show. This is barbaric what we're seeing. And people are like, well, it's just disagreement on policy. No, it's barbarism. And women are dying because the maternal mortality rate has gone up in states where abortion is banned. That that's exactly right. And I think it's all the other thing, too, I think that Democrats have a hard time threading the needle here is they really want to, I guess, grab moderate voters or make an appeal to more moderate voters about um, not, I don't know, kind of walk this fine line where, again, like Biden doesn't want to say the word abortion. Mm -hmm. They don't want to some Democratic lawmakers don't want to really come out and say, we do believe that a, a woman, an individual who needs an abortion should be able to access it when they need to access it, no matter what. They, they don't really want to say that. They kind of want to have all these caveats, I feel like, to be able to appeal to some middle ground that I'm not even sure really exists. And I feel like they they also haven't quite nailed down the message that really all of the anti-abortion legislation is about power and control. And it really fundamentally, if a Republican has a daughter and she needs to get an abortion, you better believe they're going to find a way right. to get her the procedure that she needs. And it's really all about power and control over the bodies of marginalized folks in America. And I thought it was also extremely telling when I think Biden invoked uh, women's political power um, mm -hmm. in the State of the Union speech last night that like no Republicans stood up and clapped. I don't think even women Republicans <laughs> stood up and clapped. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's part of just a much grander scheme all about control. Um, and I, I think Democrats absolutely mm -hmm. should be a lot more forceful about this and say like, you guys accuse us of believing that that people should be able to get abortions on demand anytime, anywhere. Like, yes, we do believe that. Yeah. Let's own it. Yeah. Just say the word. I mean, it, it's one yeah. uh, referendums in Ohio and Kansas. It's popular in red states. Just say the word. It's a, you know, it's think, a fundamental civil right yeah. to control your body. Like, th I can't believe this is a political discussion in 2024 <laughs> America. And it's only because of, and you know, Biden didn't do it, but we'll see in ads. Donald Trump, the moron, quoted, I mean, he bragged on CNN Town Hall and on Newsmax on camera, mm -hmm. literally saying, I terminated Roe v. Wade. He said, I. Mm -hmm terminated Roe v. Wade and was honored to do so. And he goes, I'm the one that got rid of Roe v. Wade, his exact quote on Newsmax on camera. Those are going to be ads against him all the time. And and Biden kept saying predecessor. I wish he would have said that one thing. And my predecessor has bragged saying, quote, I terminated Roe v. Wade because mm -hmm. we need America. I saw a poll that I wrote about over the weekend where a CBS poll showed about 60% of Americans think Roe v. Wade being overturned was a bad decision, but only like 30% blame Trump. You got to close that gap. It's got to be 60% saying it's bad. And that's the guy that did it. And, and that's important to me. So, I mean, the Democrats are not the best at messaging. It's sort of like uh, laughable on my show. We just we're like, okay, folks, what would you do if you could talk to them? What is there something more on messaging you like to see on this issue or, or any of the big issues that are reproductive freedom, preserving our democracy, Trump's a criminal. Like they won't even mention that Trump is charged with 32 counts of violating the Espionage Act. Imagine if, if Biden was facing 91 felonies. No, what or would the even, GOP yeah. or anything all day, nonstop? That's all they'd be talking about. They'd be building a gallows. They'd be like, I, "This is for Trump, for Biden." I think that to Alex's earlier point, we like to see the bullies get bullied. And I'd like mm -hmm. to see Biden go full hog on this. I mean, I remember one of the debates with Trump. He said, well, your son's a drug addict. And he turned around. and He was like, my son was a drug addict and he worked very hard to get better. And I'm extremely proud of him. My mother cried for weeks over that. Right. Because that's something wow. that's really relatable, mm -hmm. something that a lot of like our family has gone through. A lot of families have gone through, you know, issues with addiction and whatnot. And then when he said uh, to the transgender kids listening, your president's got your back. That sticks in the right people's heads. That makes sense. I love when Biden gets out there and he stands up for what he believes in. I think we need to see more of that. Now, is that like somebody creating a cons of TikTok to like mirror what libs of TikTok does and just like do cringe reaction content to the right? Mm -hmm. Like, why hasn't that happened yet? Maybe it's time to bully the bullies back. Um, but that's what I'm hoping we see more of uh, in the coming times here, because I think we have to stop defending who we are and what we're not and just start um, making them the joke that they have become. And, you know, in Trump's Agenda 47, it says that he's going to ban all gender affirming care for everyone, which includes anything from like breast augmentation to uh, the hormones, 
a, a lot of women need these things, especially if you're mm. victim of breast cancer or as you age, you're going to need hormones. Uh, but he would not ban Cialis or Viag Viagra, right? So make fun <laughs> of that. So talk about that. Talk about like, you know, that form of gender affirming care as something that, you know, we've all decided people need. And honestly, that's the most menacing form of gender affirming care, in my opinion. But I'm a lesbian. I don't I don't know. Maybe that's no, maybe a bias. I think there is a place for the mirror of libs of TikTok. I was going to do the morons of MAGA. And we can do that kind of thing and see what's going on. So, all right, let's take a break. And speaking of TikTok, we have to come back to something that's very near and dear to the heart of V and to my 170 followers on TikTok, which is Republicans and Democrats unanimously voted in the committee, last in the House Energy and Commerce Committee, to essentially ban TikTok if a certain condition isn't met. So let's take a break and we're going to come back continuing what just happened right after this. Ready? Come back. Coming back. And welcome back to the Dino B. Dollar Show. It is still Friday, March 8th, and continuing Alex Berg, V. Sphere, and Eric Bronsey. So, V, we have to start with you since you are known for your under the desk on TikTok, wildly popular. So, you have now House Energy and Commerce Committee, all Republicans and Democrats, 50, 50, zero. They don't agree 50, zero on anything that the ByteDance, which owns TikTok and it's a China linked company, if this becomes law and they're going to vote in the House, the question does it pass in the Senate? ByteDance will have 165 days or five months to sell TikTok and if not divested by then, it would be illegal for app store operators like Apple and Google to make it available for download. And it even seems like the U.S. has to agree, uh, approve the bot, the purchase to make sure it's a company that we approve of. So what is your take to what's going on here? All right. Hot takes one through three. Number one, who's mm -hmm. going to buy it and how do we ensure that they're going to be able to know how to run it, create source code and staff up enough to keep the experience going the way that it has been. Right. This company is based in Singapore as their CEO. It's not based in China. And the data has already been separated. It's been held in Texas for months now as part of a one point five billion dollar investment from TikTok to shield U.S. users data from the Chinese Communist Party. So one, who will it be? What infrastructure do they have in place to promise that the the platform that marginalized voices are most popular on, which is TikTok, remains functional, right? And then we have, okay, so now U.S. TikTok is owned by one entity, but the rest of TikTok, which connects to the international community, is owned by normal bite dance. How do those things interface? What's the background of that look like? How do we ensure that the United States isn't disconnected from the conversation with billions of other people? There are things that we saw on TikTok that we would have never seen had it not been for TikTok, whether that's the war in Ukraine, the Iranian women's freedom movement, the truth of what's happening in the Middle East right now, even things like the death of Next Benedict was broken on TikTok, the Tennessee wow. Three, all of these things. So th that's my question there. Uh, next up is the ignorance of the Congress people who said yes to this because they think it sounds easy. Well, why wouldn't we want to divest from China? This is an easy win for everybody. And now an American company owns it and we can buy stock in that company. They don't know how it works. You're trying to destroy a community. And the way that I know they don't know how it works is uh, the representative from New Jersey. Is it Plano? Uh, Frank, Pallone. Which... Frank Pallone. Pallone. Oh, Frank Pallone. So Frank Pallone gets on and he's like, don't worry, kids. First of all, I'm 42 years old. Don't worry, kids. We're going <laughs> to make sure. Him. You see uh, Frank Pallone? I, you know, I'm so <laughs> youthful. It's the gay glow. So we're going to make sure that you get to download all of your data and then you could just move your pictures and your dance videos to another platform. I don't have a server in my house. I have four years of content. There's no possible way to download it all and just upload it somewhere else. Or we would have done that. Truth social. So that's where it's going to go. Hunt. It's going to be for Trump. <laughs> and then, and when we look, we have a case example of someone who purchased an entity. We have Elon Musk purchased X, mm -hmm. didn't staff it properly, didn't respect the way the talent that it takes to grow and, and foster a culture to protect the digital square. And now we've destroyed that. We're seeing the destruction of local and national journalism all over the place. How far will it go before? before we have no spaces to gather in that aren't under the thumb or under the eye of those who decide what is and isn't good content. I, I think it's interesting. Uh, in the fall, I had Congressman Jamal Bowman on, who was very much against the TikTok ban, and said in his view, this was an effort by the right to prevent younger people who are using mm -hmm. it to have a community to talk about these issues. It is. And it was kind of left-leaning. But in this case, every Democrat supported this as well, which really 
There's alarm because bells they've for been me. bullied into it. They've been bullied mm-hmm. into it. Otherwise, they're not going to look strong on China to the China Hawks. They've been told that this is some sort of like uh, compromise. Well, this is an easy one. Well, it's not the Restrict Act, which was going to like give great government overreach. It's just going to be a divestment act. And these governments like Lori Trahan from Massachusetts, who was elected because of a campaign that she did with TikTokers, is like, yeah, OK, yeah, but it's going to be OK. Don't worry about it. I'm like, I'm telling you, Lori. I am worried about it. I'm genuinely worried about it. And it's never about privacy or bullying or the the future of America, because if it was, then we would be taking a stronger stance against X, against Truth Social, against online bullying in general, against these encrypted text apps that harass children constantly while they're in school. And their bullies are nameless people because they can just make up a million accounts on Signal or WhatsApp to harass them. They're never going after that stuff. They're just trying to pick TikTok because they don't understand it. They don't understand the community of it. And they just see it as a money grab. TikTok shop. You think Jeff Bezos doesn't want to get his hands on that? Of course he right. does. Right. Walmart wants to get their hands on it, too. Microsoft wants to be like the the grand villain of all things tech. They think there's all these AI things that you can do on TikTok. AI would fail on TikTok because of the authenticity that gets rewarded and the positive content that gets rewarded. That's something, you know, they worry, oh, they're going to interfere in our election. Well, have they? Because Facebook did. So and then they admit that our data is being sold a million other ways, so it's not even about the data sale. So to me, it's a huge distraction. It's very disappointing, and I think it really speaks to how out of touch a lot of these people are and how much they don't believe that this will cause an absolute national riot if they ban or try to censor TikTok. It's interesting. Alex, do you use TikTok? And- I do. I do and- use TikTok, Dean, but I'm like you, where like I have 170 followers, and I've just mm-hmm. started – actually saying stuff on TikTok as opposed to posting endless videos of my senior chihuahua, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm like trying to use it more and trying to use it more in a journalistic context. You should have done TikTok when you were doing roller derby. I know I should have. I this is another, yeah, this is another example. It's another example. There are so many disabled folks and niche communities that have built, con- you know, congregations, even religions have church on TikTok and whatnot. It's wow. a place where you can find people like yourself and feel less alone. And it's something that I really hope we don't see go away. Eric, so where do you come down? Only well, Facebook? I mean, I can imagine Zuckerberg so ecstatic at the uh, idea that TikTok uh, I'm still on, I'm, st- I'm still on MySpace, so I don't know. So that's... Uh, <laughs> How's it going? No, I... Th- no, I think if they want to destroy TikTok, just have Elon Musk buy it. That's all there they need go. to do. Six months from now, it'll be done. And he'll I run mean, it into the ground. I, I, yeah. It's kind of bizarre to see what's going on with TikTok. And there's even some Democrats who think TikTok has brainwashed young people, especially about the Middle East. And I'm like, uh, what about all the 1,000 black pastors who sent a, me- a letter to President Biden about a ceasefire and he has to work more on it. You think they're on TikTok? I don't think so. So the idea that that's just going to make people agree with politically, whatever their p- view is, people are going to find a, a way. At the end of the day, the, from what I've been reading, it's not sure the Senate would go with it. Of course, there'll be constitu- there'll be lawsuits. TikTok has a lot of money. We'll see what plays out. But they are, I saw Hakeem Jeffries, Democratic leader, said, well, we're, we're going to support this on the House floor. I'm like, wow. Tick- Banning TikTok is not going to help you parent your children, which is the other thing that I see. Well, I would love to have it banned. My kids would do more of their homework. No, they won't. They'll go on Snapchat. And I promise you, that is the most dangerous social media app in existence right now for kids. Yeah. So in my you got to see in some of these other sites or whatever apps, there's diff- there's foreign money from all these other apps. Let's see sure. what's, what's the money behind that. Mm-hmm. No doubt. But that's not they. There's a lot of things going on. China. Uh, young people learning a truth that they don't want them to learn, whatever the issue might be. And I think Jamal Bowman is very right. And he was on way before this Middle East conflict talking about young people are using it to engage, to learn. It's peer to peer and that he thought it was very powerful and needs to be protected. And we know a lot of establishment people, Republicans especially, but even some establishment Democrats, this is the party we have to deal with. But at least it's getting less and less. I'm talking with Alex Berg, V-Sphere and Eric Bronstein. So here's something that will probably be on TikTok, and it shouldn't be anywhere. Social media star turned boxer Jake Paul is going to fight former heavyweight champion Mike Tyson on July 20th at AT&T Stadium. This is true. Netflix announced it. Jake Paul's 27, Mike Tyson's 57. He still looks like he's in good shape in any event. Mm -hmm. But the point is, this is the fight that nobody needs. But Netflix is like, 
this is good for eyeball. So they're going to do a big event on their platform. It won't be pay for view per se. And that you have Netflix, you can watch it. But who, who wants to watch these people fight? Eric, did you, were you out there going, I want to see Jake Paul and Mike Tyson throw it down. This is the fight America needs. I just think he should just bite his ear off and just walk off the ring. That'd be a lot of fun. Epic. Epic. Yeah. <laughs> a one minute fight. Remember Tyson's old fights? I, I was, I remember them and they would like pump it up for months and months and pay-per-view and Tyson would win like in a minute. He'd go mm. out there. It was like a video game. You're like, boom. And the mm. guy goes down like, that's it. That's it. Everyone pick up your chips. Let's go home. Everyone go home. But who, who uh, he bought a bit uh, Evander Holyfield's ear, right? He did. Mm. Yes, you're not crazy. You're actually saying something that's <clears> truthful there. Like, I don't know if you thought, uh, Alex, is this, I mean, are you a fan of boxing? It's almost roller derby, but it's not. A I appreciate contact sports. I don't know anything about like Jake Paul fighting. I'm like, for why? Why though? Like, I'm good. I will find something else to watch, but like, all the more power to people who will find enjoyment from this. <laughs> Z, V, anything you want to. To chime in on this one, anything would this be big on TikTok? Would they divide it to one minute things? No, absolutely not. This guy's a YouTuber, and this speaks to the dangers of YouTube mm. and our children, right? <laughs> this would never happen on TikTok. We would do like I don't know a silly pillow fight or something. There's, it's a much more wholesome place overall. Okay, so let's we'll pivot back to politics, and we have to talk <laughs> the Oscars because this Sunday, and I want to see if you have seen the films or whatever. But one thing back in politics, all the way back on Monday, which is like a lifetime ago. The Supreme Court told us that Donald Trump can engage in an insurrection, but states can't ban him. They did not even dispute the findings of the trial court in Colorado, nor the Colorado Supreme Court, which affirmed that decision that Donald Trump engaged in an insurrection as contemplated by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. But the Supreme Court goes, nope, you can't ban him. So now what? I mean, they essentially rewrote the 14th Amendment and we're all like, oh, I guess that's OK. Uh Eric, you're a big 14th Amendment fan. What, what do you think? <laughs> you're saying that the Supreme Court, Court just pulled something out of their ass? I, 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 they don't do that, do they? I mean, it's they just make it up as they go along at this point. You know, I mean, it is such a political decision, and it's not even left right. This, this, the nine O part was more like it's not good for America. It'll be a patchwork. So, well, forget the legal analysis. Here's the result we're going to do. We're going to be like protecting everyone. I mean, a Alex. Should they have banned Donald Trump? Do you think it would have caused a great rift in America? Someone like January 6th type of thing? I mean, what do you think would have happened? I mean, would it have caused a bigger rift in America than the rift that already exists in America? This felt so weird because it's like, yes, you committed an insurrection, but we're not the ones who are supposed to hold you accountable for that. Like, it's such a weird technicality. And honestly, it is giving me uh, PTSD because it reminds me of the feeling that in the lead up to the 2016 election, where public officials, where stuff was coming up about Trump and public officials made a series of very consequential decisions about how to hold him accountable or not, or how to hold Hillary Clinton accountable for information that came up about her emails, et cetera, or not. And I'm just getting that feeling that like we are careening towards the general election and we're seeing public officials, the Supreme Court, et cetera, make a series of decisions to not hold him accountable. And it just feels bad. It, it, it's like very worrisome to me. And it's bringing that feeling that like, kind of everybody is saying like, this is not our place. Like, yes, we believe he's an, an insurrectionist, but we're not gonna do anything about it. And we're just gonna march right up to November of 2024 and see how it all shakes out. I think the, in the bigger picture, Tom, touching on what Alex said, the sense that Donald Trump, attempted a coup we all saw the january 6th attack mm -hmm. which was all his it's three years and a few months later and there's no trials happening and he's able to game the system mm -hmm. and the supreme court is helping him with the immunity case so they're going to hear it the week of april 22nd now we know it's april 25th it couldn't even be the monday they got to do it on the thursday of the week and then they're not going to give his decision to mayor june so that doesn't happen and then the judge he personally appointed judge cannon is protecting him down there the only thing that's probably going to happen is march 25th two weeks from now Trump's trial in New York, but it doesn't it does it just further the narrative that we all knew deep down, but was not in this, our face that the rich and white, especially and conservative that have connections live a vastly different life. And if if Donald Trump was a person of color or even a middle class or lower income white person, he would be held accountable. As Abraham Lincoln looks over <laughs> my shoulder here in my background, I'd like to 
remind folks that history matters and the decisions we make set precedents, even if they don't have consequences at that exact time. And if we would have hung the traitors and Confederate soldiers at the end of the Civil War, would we be in a different situation now? Because a lot of times with Donald Trump, the precedents that they bring forward and the laws that they're citing for precedents are from the end of the Civil War when Abraham Lincoln decided that they weren't going to hang the traitors and the treasonists because they were going to try to bring the nation together. So now Trump's defense is, hey, I'm, pr- I'm basically a Confederate soldier And back then you allowed them to just rejoin society and run for office and hold office again. And I think that that is maybe where we went wrong. Maybe we should have hung the traitors after the Confederate. uh, I think if Jefferson, if Jefferson Davis ran in the Republican Party right now, he'd at least get 25 percent of the vote at least. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, I think more. Are you kidding me? Because Trump is their Jefferson Davis. He is their grand wizard. He is their (laughs) the leader they've been waiting for. And. I, I think the GOP is gone as the party that we once knew. And I don't know if if MAGA ends up just controlling it or if there's actually a split and a new party forms with a different name. I, I just don't know where it's going. And I think we're going to see more Christian nationalism for sure. I don't think I don't. I used to think that maybe we were getting a death rattle, but I think there's a death rattle to Trumpism. But there's a steady drumbeat to Christian nationalism. And that's something that we have to just keep so forward in our thoughts. That's absolutely true. I mean, look at the Speaker of the House sitting there last night is a Christian nationalist. This is someone who does not believe in the wall between church and state. Actually, he believes that his religious beliefs should be the law of this land. And they openly talk about this. So, yes. And I don't know. I've said this on my show. I don't believe MAGA and our Democratic Republic can coexist when that's one of the major two parties. If it was a lesser party, if we had like five parties, you could have a 10 percent party. But I also think with Christian nationalism, which is part of MAGA, I don't believe it, our, our Republican coexist. It's if that's the party, because if we lose any election, it's like they usher in a whole new way. Alex, how concerned are you about Christian nationalism and this right wing theocracy? I mean, I'm super concerned. Like, I think looking at Kate Britt uh, and her rebuttal last night, I think that one of the things that I find so frightening about it is that these Christian nationalists, they're able to package themselves up so that they seem like more normal or they're able to package up this really dangerous rhetoric in a, in kind of a more civil delivery where she looks respectable, the Speaker of the House looks professional. And I think in some way that's even more insidious because um, I think it'll kind of convince people who maybe wouldn't support these people that they're somehow more moderate than MAGA folks to support. So, I, I mean, I'm terrified. <laughs> it's greatly concerning. And, you know, Eric, it's like we can't impose our religious beliefs. I don't know if you have religious beliefs, but I, that. Who, do you have me? religious beliefs? Yes. I, I pray to trees. It's a whole kind of religion. I don't want to get into it, but go ahead. So, all right. So let's talk about. Academy Awards, even though this is forward looking, I know it's what just happened. We're going to we're going to break the conceit of the entire segment here to talk about the Oscars. Now, first of all, uh, will any of you want will you want like are you people that watch it? Let me start with you. V, are you someone who watches the Oscars? Part of it? All of it? I don't. I don't. don't. Okay. Fair enough. It's actually like a big flaw of mine that I don't really know celebrities. I did the glad red carpet last year and I was not invited back this year because I couldn't identify any of the celebrities. (laughs) Oh, to interview them? I just, yeah, I don't know who they are. I was like literally on the live and like my fans are telling me who people are because I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, I do this and like I know every TikToker and I know all the journalists at the newspapers and the trads and whatnot. But the only celebrities I know are from 90 Day Fiance and Love After Lockup. Like I don't huh. know true celebrities. So I'm not I'm not big for the Oscars. Eric, what about you? You're a much huge Oscar fan, right? You're gonna No, I do I do like him. I do like and I like some of the nominees this year, like Jeffrey Wright and and uh, Giamatti. Those are those are kind of some of my favorite actors. Well, do you watch uh, any of this? Emma Stone is a great actress. She sure. probably I think she'll, she's going to win. The only thing I don't like is now in the best picture category, there's 10. That started the last few years. Used to, I, I think it's too much. It just seems like every movie just gets nominated. Just nominate just one and make it easier. Just nominate one. <laughs> and then we're done. That's it. We've nominated right. and they're the winner. Same time. What are you, about you, Alex? Are, are you a, an Oscar person? Like, are you, is there any fun to it? I'll watch like bits and pieces of it. I love to see like a red carpet look, um, but I'm not like, you know, intent on carving out time on Sunday to make sure I'm like sitting on my couch at the exact time the Oscars start. I'm, I'm sure I'll see a bunch of it and I'll be curious about the winners, but 
I'm not like so intense. I would actually rather sit and watch the movies than the ceremony ah. itself. Mm -hmm. So here are the, the 27 films nominated for best film. I'm going to read them on those. And that was actually 10 of them. Uh, American Fiction, Anatomy of the Fall, Barbie, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, Poor Things, The Zone of Interest. Have Has anyone seen all of them? No, it's that's, uh, that's almost impossible. <laughs> I, I started Barbie, watching Barbie, that's it. <laughs> No, I started watching Killers of the Flower Moon yesterday. I'm still watching it. It's, it's a good uh, movie. I like it. It's like 17 hours long, though. It's ridiculous. The problem is, the, the thing is there, De Niro is good, but it's like Goodfellas in the West in the 1800s. Like, it's <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. If you haven't seen it, there's like, they're whacking people. I was just waiting for like Joe Pesci to show up. Like, hey, what's the guy over here? Well, Alex, how many have you seen of these 10? I think I've actually seen five of them. I've seen Anatomy of the Fall, Barbie, Poor Things, The Zone of Interest. I started watching Killers of the Flower Moon. And I have to say, for me, I was having a tough time getting into it. I read the book, which I thought was so compelling. So maybe oh. I just need to go back and rewatch. I really want to watch um, Oppenheimer and Past Lives and American Fiction. And the whole, American actually, uh, I'll great. watch them all. I'll eventually, I'll, I'll get to them. And I, I do want to watch them all. We've seen almost all because uh, Han, my fiance, is an actress. So she's in SAG. So you get the screeners so you can vote. Oh, yeah. American fiction was remarkable. Barbie, we, we saw, of course, it's really fun. Holdovers with Paul Giamatti's very good. Killers yeah. Flower Moon. Maestro was interesting. Like, it, it's good and interesting. Oppenheimer is very, very good. Past Lives is like a small thing. Poor Things I like because Rama Yusuf, my buddy, is one of the co-stars uh, of the <laughs> film. And he doesn't even play an Arab character. He plays like a British guy. He's got like a British accent. I'm like, mm. you, you know, nothing Arab about it. Did you, what, did you see Poor Things, Eric? No, I haven't watched it yet, but I, I, I think it's on Hulu right now. I'm going to watch it today, but I heard it's really good. I want to I want to see them all. Well, and by the way, do you guys know someone's been nominated five times for an Oscar and never won? V is the only one that didn't. It's nominated this year. So V is not is the only person who didn't get the topics in advance. Can you guess who the person is? <laughs> you love celebrities so much. Who's nominated this year, nominated five times. It's a woman. Never won. Beyonce. No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. She gets, she never just, wins when she should. You know, so that's I, what's going on. Here. Well, Annette she just Benning. always gets Annette, snubbed. Annette, Annette Benning, Benning is nominated to mm -hmm. Diana Nyad and does a great job as a swimmer. But I didn't realize that until I saw a scene article. It's like nominated five times, never won. I'm like, who is that? Because usually the, 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 the academies make it up to you. They're like, okay, at yeah. number four. But for Annette Benning, they're like, nope. You've been around. Glenn, Glenn Close never won either, which I, that was always surprised me because for years she was in like every Oscar movie. She yeah. never won. I've never won either. Okay. So, Eric, <laughs> we're going to have any sympathy or concern. But about Dino Bidala, never an Oscar, never an Emmy, never a Grammy. There's not even a radio award that I've been nominated for. But all right, before we run out of time, I'd love people to tell people where they can find you. V, we'll start with you because your days are numbered on TikTok. So, you might as well get people <laughs> to watch you now. I hope not. I hope TikTok doesn't go anywhere, sincerely. But where can people follow you? You can find me at under the desk news. <clears throat> you can find me at under the desk news on all platforms. You can also listen to my new podcast with the Betches Media Network. It's called American Fever Dream, where we give you just enough about what's going on without depleting your faith in humanity. Very good. Congratulations on the new podcast. Thank uh, you. Alex, what about you, my friend? You can find me at yeah. It's Alex Berg all over social media and check out it'salexberg.com for all of my latest projects. And Eric Bronstein. Uh, MySpace, no, uh, Friendster, uh, no, uh, just uh, follow me on, on Instagram, E R I K, uh, Eric B. Comic. That's it. Eric B. Comic, very funny comic. Yeah. Check him out. Well, Alex V and Eric, thank you guys so much for being on. I really appreciate it. Uh, have a great week. We're